and to distort prices and fix wages and all kinds of things that created the Depression. And then Roosevelt came in and proceeded to make it worse. And everything that Roosevelt did exacerbated it and made the Depression great. And we eventually got out of it after the Second World War. But how can anybody say that we got out of it because of Roosevelt? We got out of it despite Roosevelt. We would have got out of it a lot faster had Roosevelt not just expanded the failed policies of Hoover. And that's very similar to what's happening now. You got Bush, who is the Hoover now of this generation, who is now associated with the free market, who is nothing but anything like the free market. And now we have Barack Obama, like Roosevelt, coming in uh, to save the economy with big government. Of course, the government is already huge. Maybe he hasn't figured that out. When, when, uh, when Hoover left office, I think the federal budget was about $4 billion. That was the whole thing. And Roosevelt doubled it to about $8 billion. Now we're $3 trillion. $3 trillion. I mean, so the government is huge. And of course, when, when Roosevelt came in, we had a sound economy beneath the surface. I mean, we had a productive economy. We saved. We made stuff. We exported. We didn't have a huge social welfare state. Nobody got checks from the government. We're in much better shape. If they did that much damage to a sound economy, imagine what they could do with the one we got now. Plus, back then, we had, we had real money. We were on the gold standard. Now look at us. I mean, look at, all the, look at the problems we had in the 1970s, right? Still, we had a fundamentally sound economy then. We, we had a bubble in the 60s. Same thing, the nifty fit the same stock market bubble. We printed too much money. We went to Vietnam. I mean, we fought the war in Vietnam. We went to the moon. We had the war on poverty. The government created too much money, and they gave us the 1970s. That was the payback for the 1960s. But when, when Reagan came in and when uh, Volcker came in, we actually got some sensible policies. We shrank government and we raised interest rates. We went for sound money and smaller government. You know, when Reagan came in, it was the government is the problem. Now, Barack Obama is the government's solution. We're not going to, I mean, we're, it's, it's night and day. And, you know, there's a lot of other people that say we can't, we can't repeat the mistakes of Japan. Well, again, we're doing exactly what Japan did. Japan had a bubble in the 1980s. Why did they have a bubble? Same reason we had a bubble. They kept their interest rates too low. Why did they do that? To keep the yen artificially low, because they didn't want the dollar to collapse. Kind of like what we did with Great Britain in the 1920s. Very, very similar. So the Japanese kept interest rates too low. And they're still too low. But they kept them too low and they had a bubble. Two bubbles. Stocks and real estate. Pretty familiar. <laughs> Stock market bubble burst first. Real estate bubble two or three years later. And of course, real estate prices are still falling in Japan. What was it? 15, 20 years later? They've fallen 70 or 80%. And that's in a country where you lose faith if you don't pay your debts. You know, they didn't, you know, so I mean, if you can, and they have high savings. But the problem in Japan was the government in Japan refused to allow the market to function. Didn't want to take the pain of the deleveraging and the unwinding of the bubble. So they intervened and intervened and intervened and ran up the deficits and postponed this thing and dragged it out. But the main difference between Japan and America is Japan was a wealthy nation that could afford all that big government. I mean, they would have been better off without it, but the, econ the Japanese economy beneath the surface was so competitive and so fundamentally sound that they survived anyway. They had enough domestic savings to fund the growth of government. The Japanese didn't borrow any money from anybody else. Nobody would lend it to them. The Japanese citizens financed that gigantic government. But they still have a high savings rate. They're still the world's biggest uh, uh, current account uh, nation. They're the world's largest creditor nation, even still bigger than China. So they were a wealthy country. Yet the Japanese government managed to create so much damage to an economy that was fundamentally sound. We're the exact opposite. There's no way that we can get off as easy as Japan. Because we're a mess. We're the world's biggest debtor. We have a huge trade deficit. We have no domestic savings. And we're already loaded up with debt. And the only hope we have of artificially stimulating our economy is that we borrow the money from the rest of the world. We don't have it on our own. So when the world um, stops financing this and you know, 
it's going to come to an end, and we're going to have to make these hard choices. Is it going to be hyperinflation, or is it, are, we going to, are we going to do the right thing? But the rest of the world, and a lot of people think, and this is, I have, I've had a lot of arguments, and people call it decoupling. They think, well, you know, this is never going to happen, or when America stops consuming, the whole world is finished. They're not finished. You know, we're not the engine of the world's economy. We're the caboose. <laughs> and if you decouple the caboose, the cars move faster. You know, I mean, we're not doing the world any favors consuming their stuff. You know, I mean, it's just, it's vendor financing. But people say, we're, every, we're the best customer. We're not. We're the worst customer because we don't pay. <laughs> a good customer pays you. And in, in the world of trade, you pay for imports with exports. And if you don't have anything to export, you can't pay. And that's what we have. We, we, we issue an IOU. And when the world finally lets the dollar collapse, and they will, our purchasing power isn't going to vanish. It's just going to be redistributed. Other currencies are going to rise. And people in other countries, people that are working in factories right now in China that are producing products and just you know, shipping them abroad and just kind of waving goodbye, you know, all of a sudden, they'll be able to afford them. The Chinese will be able to turn in their bicycles and buy automobiles because steel will be cheaper, because cars will be cheaper, because the value of their wages will rise because their currency will gain purchasing power. It's the Americans who are going to be buying the bicycles because all of a sudden, cars will be too expensive for us. Gasoline will be too expensive for us because we'll be bidding with currency of much less value. And that's what's going to happen. And the world is not going to suffer because we don't, we don't buy their stuff. They're going to benefit because now there's going to be more stuff for them. I mean, right now, because the world lends us so much money, there's a capital shortage. Wouldn't the world be better off investing their savings productively in their own countries rather than just giving them their savings to us? Wouldn't they be better off enjoying the fruits of their own labor rather than laboring while we enjoy the fruits? It's obvious, and it's going to happen. Anyway, I don't know how long I've been talking. <laughs> huh? But... Uh, Anyway, did I have any time for any questions? Oh, anyway, well, that's it. <laughs> and, uh...